Hi and welcome to this Leaving Cert Higher Level Probability Review video. So this video will have absolutely no examples. We are just focusing in on what you need to know before approaching any exam questions. And um, there is a video which reviews all these types of questions and I will link that in the description below. So the different styles of questions we see, we see the ones where they're talking about using sets or Venn diagrams or even the questions where we could use sets or Venn diagrams to help us. We have conditional probability, independent events, tree diagrams, expected value, Bernoulli trials, using permutations, and finally, our Z scores, which is kind of creeping into the statistics style questions. So I'm going to go through each of these um, and just talk a little bit more about them. So the first is about sets. So generally speaking, and means multiply and or means add. So if I wanted the probability of getting a head, if I toss a coin, and then the probability of getting tails, I would talk about multiplication. If I wanted to understand rolling a dice, the probability of getting a two or getting a three, in that case, I would add. So that's a really general, now that's like I said, really general, but it's a good starting point. If we talk about our sets then, we have our universal set here and just in it in red is some very useful little notations. So we have um, the probability of A intersection B there in the middle. We have that little dash A complement, B complement and so on. Just note that the total probability of a universal set set should be one. So when you add all those probabilities together in A, B and outside of A and B, it should add to one. If we talk about the probability of A or B happening, we talk about union, so it's A or B. So it could be either circle. But note, in a case where A and B are not mutually exclusive, so where there is an overlap, it's not enough for us just to add. We also then have to take away the intersection. So that would be a case where the two um, events can happen at the same time. So if we talk about A union B just being PA plus PB, so that's the idea, like I gave the example earlier of rolling a three or a four, and they could simply be added, that means that they are A and B are mutually exclusive, and this is what they would look like. There will be no overlap. So bear that in mind. So sometimes um, it's not possible for two events to happen. So it's not possible to roll a three and roll a four at the same time. It's one or the other, they will be mutually exclusive. However, there's other cases where, think of playing cards, it could be red and a three, they are not mutually exclusive. So anything we need for our sets notation is available in your log tables on page 23. Just note that they are short on this little symbol, which we see quite a lot, especially in the mock questions. So you'll commonly see this complement still dash, so A complements everything that's not in A or the opposite of A. So the probability of A dash or A complement means the probability that A does not happen. So now let's talk about conditional probability. So this is probability where there's a condition attached. So conditional probability is usually coined by this word given. So when we see the word given, we know it's conditional probability. That being said, we have seen questions that require conditional probability that don't explicitly use the word given. So you need to think in terms of what does that word mean for you? Don't just use it as, oh, if it says given, I use conditional probability. We talk about conditional probability as the probability of A happen, happening given that B has happened. So the formula is A um, and the straight line. Now be careful probability of A given B is how that's read. Sometimes that's confused with set difference, which is a, black, a backslash. So just be really clear about that. Make sure it's clear in your writing. But this is equal to the probability of A intersection B, so the probability that A and B happens, all divided by the probability that B has happened. Now, if we extend that further and say, well, in the case of independent events, so these are events that don't affect each other, 
then we're talking about there is no technically conditional probability because if they don't affect each other, the probability that A happens given B has happened is just the same as the probability that A has happened. And when we have that idea, we can use that substitution in the conditional probability formula and we get what is the independent events formula. So that is the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So that is just a rearranging of the conditional probability formula where A is not affected by B happening. So independent events look like this and this is important because sometimes students mix up that idea of mutually exclusive and independent there is an overlap and the overlap is actually a b so as in a multiplied by b just as a tip here and um, when we use we use the above formula in two different ways the first one is if they want us to see is this independent verify its independent events and so on but the second way is when you're told that events are independent and watch out for that chances are you're going to need to use this formula in some way sometimes it's not just using this formula there'll be more to the question but watch out when you see the word independent you need this formula so then another way we can work is called tree diagrams. So probability tree diagrams are very useful when we want to understand the probability of multiple events and when event diagram is not suitable. So maybe there's too many different outcomes. So we've seen it like there's males and females and they are then broken further into smokers, non-smokers. So you want to somehow represent this and a tree diagram is the easiest way to do that. So this is what one set of branches look like. We start at a given point. Um, I've done this here for heads and tails, so tossing a coin. There is a 0 0.5 chance, or the probability is 0 0.5 of getting a head, or 0 0.5 of getting a tail. They are the outcome. So it's important to note that each set of branches should add to one. And generally, we see two or three branches from each point. So we wouldn't see more than three, because it'll get quite complicated. So two and three tends to be the norm for a leaving cert higher level. So here's an extended one where we've talked about actually not just tossing a coin, but then tossing it a second time. Um, when we toss it a second time, that allows us to get all the possible outcomes. And when we want to talk about the prob the prob sorry, the probability of each of these outcomes we want to multiply along the branch. So they have really kindly highlighted this for us already. So if I said, what's the probability of rolling heads and heads? We're going to multiply 0 0.5 by 0 0.5. And um, you could have done this the traditional way using that general, I, roll, I toss a coin and get heads and toss a coin and get heads again. So that and means multiply. Um, but this is just to get a sense of a tree diagram. The second thing to note is that the total of the overall probability should add to one and this is a really good check to do. Generally with the tree diagrams we will see them given to us um, on the paper or at least we have up to now. I think drawing out a tree diagram it can waste quite a lot of valuable time. So what we've seen to, up to now um, on the real paper is that the tree diagram is there and we're filling in information. The mock questions um don't give us the tree diagrams that might ask us to draw it we have seen questions where maybe a tree diagram could be useful but if there's another way around it and uh, they won't necessarily give you the tree diagram but you're welcome to use it in any case where you feel it could be helpful so let's talk a little bit about expected value so expected value and this is the value expect to get and what i always bring back here is it's the idea of an average or really a mean and what we're talking about here is this formula here. It is the sum of x times the probability of x. So I'm going to go into an example. For example, if I roll a dice, the expected value I have of a dice is 3.5. And that might seem really strange because you definitely will not get 3.5 when you roll a dice. However, if you were to roll your dice a load and loads of times, so say thousands of times, we should find that when we get an average or a mean of all our results, we will get 3.5. And that's because each number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, should come up this roughly the same amount of times if it's a fair die. So this is an average. And keep that in mind, because sometimes expected value seems a bit strange. Like, well, how would we expect to do that? 
So a table would be very helpful. I like using tables. A table would look something like this. X stands for the outcome. So what is the outcome? Px then is the probability of that outcome. And then we have x times probability of x. So for example, we could see this as like a lot of win. So um, there could be outcomes if you match like four numbers and then five numbers and six numbers. So there's all these different um, possible outcomes that will give us money. And then what's the probability of each of those outcomes? The final answer then comes from the sum. So I've just popped back up here that that's um, summation is a sigma, it's capital sigma. I know we have lowercase sigma in statistics. And that means sum or add together. So we're going to add everything in this column together and that will effectively be our expected value. So this is very useful if you want to understand um, how much you should charge for a game of chance. So we've seen questions where there is a spinner game. We've seen questions with lotto, anything where there is a chance, then you win, and then how much should you charge? So it's always good to charge more than what you expect to pay out because otherwise you're not gonna make any money. And most of our questions, it's like charity lottos and things like that. So next thing I'm gonna talk about is Bernoulli trials. So it's on page 33 of your log tables. It's down here. So Bernoulli trials is so-called after Swiss mathematician Jacob Bernoulli, but it is also commonly known as the binomial distribution because it has only two outcomes by two and um, success or failure. So this is our formula and the formula is N choose or times p to the power of or times q to the power of n minus or, where n is the number of trials, or is the number of successes. And I use that in kind of inverted commas because sometimes success and failure, it's what, it, the success is the thing that you want. p is the probability of success, and then q is one minus p, which is the probability of failure. So for example, if you know the probability that you will win, then what's the probability you don't win? So then the question that comes up a huge amount about these is, well, when do you use this formula? And this has to be one of the most overused formula at the most inappropriate times. And I put it down to the fact that it's one of the only formula we have for probability that's in our log tables. So you use it when you know that something has happened over a number of trials, but you don't know the order. So for example, if I told you that you get, um, you roll it, you'll toss a coin and you get heads, then tails, then heads, then heads. That is very specific. You know the order and you can go back to using tree diagram or just your, um, I roll heads and tails and heads and heads. So that and meaning multiply. However, if I say to you, I toss a coin four times and I get heads three of those times, I've now taken that order away. And because you don't know the order, you have to look at all the different ways that that can happen. And how Bernoulli does that is it's that N choose or, which is the combination. So how many different ways can this happen? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more next. So the second time where you know if you use this formula is if you know when the last one happens, but you don't know the order before that. So this is kind of the extension of Bernoulli. And we take this and we split it into the piece that we don't know the order. So the Bernoulli piece and the piece that we do know the order. So for example, I toss a coin four times. And what's the probability that the fourth and um, the fourth toss is heads or the fourth toss is the third head. So you know the heads happen right then, but you need to understand then what happens before. We don't know the order before. So we know part of the order and specifically the last part, um, but we don't know the order before that. So let's talk a little bit about permutations and combinations. And this gets, um, I suppose, put underneath the umbrella of probability. And um, we see them as questions on their own, more likely on mocks than the actual exam papers, but it's good to know what you're doing because they can be very helpful in probability questions. So permutation is an arrangement of all or part of a set of objects where the order is important. So a permutation, that's the order is important. So for example, A, B, C and C, B, A are considered to be very different permutations. A combination is an arrangement 
of all are part of a set of objects where the order of the arrangement is not important, i.e. A, B, C and C, B, A are considered to be the same combination. So I suppose where might order be important and where might order not be important? So order wouldn't be important when you're dealt out cards because you get five cards and it doesn't matter what order you get them in, you can reshuffle them yourself within your hands. They're still the same five cards. However, if you were talking about a race, obviously coming first, second or third, that's very different. It's not just three people win. So when we talk about permutations, we generally rely on this idea of and because we the questions we get are a lot more they're a lot easier to follow and we're not going to see it as much as we see the combinations when we deal with the combinations we use this ncor or this n choose or either notation and it's the number of ways in which we choose or objects out of a set containing n different objects such that the order of the selection does not matter. For example, being dealt a hand of cards, order doesn't matter. And that's a really important one. So if you want to look at anything got to do with the combinations, page 20 here in our log tables has a little bit under the binomial theorem. Uh, the binomial theorem has these binomial coefficients, which are n choose or. They are what we use for combinations. We generally see that n choose or, and we have often had to use that little formula there on the right. So this question comes up a lot. When do we use combinations? So these are again useful when there's a number of ways that the outcome can occur, but it's not Bernoulli. And this is why I cover Bernoulli first, because you say, mm, is that not the same thing as Bernoulli? But we don't have a number of trials and you'll see what I mean. So here are some examples. You choose three digits. What's the probability that one is a nine? You choose three digits. What's the probability that they're all even? You are dealt a hand of five cards. What's the probability that you have a jack? Now, if you wanted to break those down into Bernoulli, you could, but it'll make the probability part a little bit harder. It's much easier to use combinations, so that N choose or, um, to see how many different ways can you pick three digits? How many different ways can you get dealt five cards? And then talk about, well, how many ways have a jack? So the last one I'm going to talk about is Z-scores. So this is using um, statistical measures, and in particular, the mean and standard deviation. So you'll recognize these questions because they'll talk about mean and standard deviation. And we generally talk about the probability in the form P bracket X is, say, less than or equal to three. And then what we do is we have to standardize that. So um, I'll link the video below, which goes through Z-scores in a lot more detail. I'm only going to fly through it here. But the idea is that we take something that is normally distributed and we effectively force it or standardize it to become a standard normal. And once it's standard normal, it means we can use our log tables um, on page 36 and 37 um, to work out answers. So first of all, before we do that, we have to go to page 34 and use this standardizing formula to convert our X, in this case three, to a Z. And to do that, you need the X, you need the mu, which is the mean and standard deviation, the sigma. So this is page 36, 37. Um, and just to be aware, this part I find really useful when we're trying to figure it out. I will always be saying sketch it, see how you're going with it. Because you can only look this table up if you're on the right hand side, so above zero. And if you're looking for the shaded piece to the left. So that is where the probability that Z is less than or equal to some number. And that number is given there on the table. If it doesn't look like that, you need to do a little bit of work. If you want to revise the work, like I said, the video link for Z scores is in the description below.